Welcome back to the Psyche and Singularity series. I've been going over my book, Psyche and Singularity, Jungian Psychology, and Holographic String Theory. In this video, I'm going to explain the beginnings of Jung, of Carl Jung's and Wolfgang Pauli's theory of a mirror symmetry between the laws of psychology and the laws of physics, and I'm going to contrast their theory to Leonard Susskind's theory of what he calls instinctive consciousness. In the previous video, I completed the overview of the history of the philosophical concept of the self, which in the Western world went from Plato's theory of the soul of the universe being in the central point, which also encompasses the outermost sphere. We saw how St. Augustine fused that with Christian theology and how that worldview lasted all the way through the medieval period up until Dante's poem, The Divine Comedy, culminating with the Paradiso and the image of God's throne as a brilliant point of light out at the outermost sphere of the universe that somehow encompasses the outermost sphere. And then I showed how that cosmology fell with Copernicus's theory that the Earth is not the center of the universe, but rather orbits around the sun with the other planets. And then how Descartes tried to reestablish faith in the soul using skeptical human reason, how David Hume responded to Descartes with his empiricist philosophy, which says if you can't perceive it with your sense organs, it's just an uh, imaginary idea, and then how Immanuel Kant tried to fuse the rationalism of Descartes and Plato with David Hume's empiricism, with his theory of the a priori categories of thought, especially space, time, and causality, and that Carl Jung took that theory of the a priori categories of thought full circle back to Plato's original theory of the absolute ideas of the soul, which includes the soul of the universe, which is in the central point and the outermost sphere of the cosmos. So I'm also saying Leonard Susskind has inadvertently recreated Plato's or rediscovered Plato's original academic cosmology. So Wolfgang Pauli, Nobel Prize winning founder of quantum mechanics, he worked with Carl Jung for over 25 years, from 1932 until his death in 1958. And I'm going to read a, a couple of, a few sections from the book. First, a quote from Pauli, where he talks about the search for the mirror symmetries between psychology and physics, and he relates that back to Plato's theory. And then I'll read from Carl Jung, who says, yes, my theory of the collective unconscious archetypes is just a restatement of Plato's theory of the absolute ideas. And then I'm going to contrast that Platonic Jungian theory to Susskind's theory that of what he calls instinctive comprehension that we were hardwired by evolutionary pressure to perceive the world according to Newtonian physics concepts, three-dimensional space and linear time. Although, and he says that evolutionary pressure could not have made us have any instinctive knowledge of 20th century physics. I point out that that contradicts the historical record which shows that the Vedanta philosophy and Plato's philosophies, the pillars of Eastern and Western philosophy, have a cosmology that is remarkably similar to Leonard Susskind's, which implies that we do have this instinctive comprehension or archetypal knowledge of the cosmology that Susskind is rediscovering or has rediscovered. So I will read first from Wolfgang Pauli, who Leonard Susskind greatly respects as one of history's greatest theoretical physicists, he says, in the cosmic landscape. So here is a quote from Wolfgang Pauli. He says, The ordering and regulating factors must be placed beyond the distinction of physical and psychic. The ordering and regulating factors, he's talking about the, the sources of the laws of physics and psychology. So they must be placed beyond the distinction of physical and psychic as Plato's ideas share the notion of a concept and of a force of nature. They create actions out of themselves. I am very much in favor of referring to the ordering and regulating factors in terms of archetypes, but then it would be impermissible to define them as contents of the psyche. The mentioned inner images, dominant features of the collective unconscious after Jung, are rather psychic manifestations of the archetypes which, however, would also have to put forth, create, condition, anything law-like in the behavior of the corporeal world. So then this com here comes the essential part of his 
of this quote, the laws of this world would then be the physical manifestations of the archetypes. Each law of nature should then have an inner correspondence and vice versa, even though this is not always directly visible today. So mind and matter both emerge from the collective unconscious archetypes, which Pali relates back to Plato's absolute ideas imprinted on the soul. The ultimate idea from which all other ideas radiate, according to Plato, is the idea of the good, which Carl Jung calls the archetype of the self, the archetype of the union of all opposites. It's the source of all archetypes, and all archetypes seek to reunify with that source. It's the end, therefore, that all archetypes strive for, the beginning and the end, like the alpha and omega. So that origin of mind and matter, that common origin, explains the mirror symmetries between the laws of physics and the laws of psychology. So I'm ultimately saying, and Carl Jung says that the image, the psychic image that comes up in the mind from the archetype of the self is the mandala, a circle with, or a sphere with a central point, and it represents the union of all opposites. So a big founding stone of this book was my question to myself, if the laws of physics mirror the laws of psychology, and if there is a psychic image that you might see in a dream or in a fantasy of a mandala shape, and it's, it's the collective unconscious trying to lead a psyche back to, to harmony after being pulled by opposing demands, what is the physical correlate of the psychic mandala images? And I'm saying it is the gravitational effects of black holes including the inside-out black hole universe. And that, therefore, ultimately, I'm saying the laws of holographic string theory described by Leonard Susskind and Gerard Tehuft are the physical manifestations of the psychic law of the archetype of the self with its mandala images arising in the mind. So I just want to read how Carl Jung very openly admits his theory of the archetypes is rooted in Plato's theory of the ideas. So he's, according to Jung, archetype is an explanatory paraphrase of the Platonic eidos. For our purposes, this term is helpful because it tells us that so far as the collective unconscious contents are concerned, we are dealing with universal images that have existed since the remotest time. So then he'll go on in another quote to say, take, for instance, the word idea. It goes back to the eidos concept of Plato. And the eternal ideas are primordial images stored up in a supra-celestial place as eternal, transcendent forms. The eye of the seer perceives them as imagines et lares, or as images in dreams and revelatory visions. It is sufficient to know that there is not a single important idea or view that does not possess historical antecedents. Ultimately, they are all founded on primordial archetypal forms. So there is not an important idea in the history of humanity that does not have some historical precursor. In the previous videos, I've showed how the Vedanta cosmology of India and Plato's cosmology are the historical antecedents of this fusion of Jung and Susskind that I describe in the book, Psyche and Singularity. So with that in place, I'll now turn to Susskind and now he talks about what, what he calls instinctive comprehension. So he believes, he says here, all complex life forms have built-in instinctive physics concepts that have been hardwired into their nervous system by evolution. So he believes that Darwinian evolution forces human beings and other animals to perceive the world in the context of three-dimensional space and linear time. Although he believes that there are 11 dimensions, but that we have not, that he'll go on to say that uh, there is no way that evolutionary pressure could have created an instinctive comprehension of these radically different worlds, the radically different worlds described by 20th century physics, from special relativity on through holographic string theory. I'm saying, well, there is, whether it was evolutionary pressure or not, there is an instinctive comprehension of those radically different worlds. We saw that in the Vedanta cosmology and Plato's cosmology. So I want to analyze 
Susskind's term instinctive comprehension because he mentions instinctive comprehension, but he does not mention the unconscious mind. Whereas Carl Jung says that it's precisely the introduction of the concept of instinct that necessitates that we meditate upon the unconscious mind. And I also want to show how this idea that three-dimensional space and linear time are forced upon us by Darwinian evolution, although they, they don't really express the reality of the cosmos. It's a circular reasoning. He, he's, he's using this logical fallacy of circular reasoning. The universe is not a Darwinian world of three-dimensional space, but Darwinian evolution forces us to perceive it that way. Well, that claim assumes that the world is a Newtonian mechanistic cosmos made of little bits of matter floating randomly in three dimensions of space along a um, steadily moving timeline because that's the theory of evolution. Those little bits of matter gradually over e eons of time combine in a way that creates self-replicating life. If those are not simply fictions of the mind, for Darwinian evolution to exist, there has to be this Newtonian worldview, which Susskind is saying is illusory. So I'm going to read a little bit here from the book. On page 98, I say, in other words, according to Susskind's materialist theory of the origin of consciousness, in order for the first living being to evolve from matter, hardwired to instinctively perceive the world through the classical Newtonian physics concepts of objectively and continuously existing bits of insentient matter moving through three dimensions of absolute space along one dimension of linear time flowing forward everywhere in the universe at a constant rate, those illusory but evolutionarily valuable concepts must paradoxically have been in effect eons earlier or there would never have been a temporal process of material evolution to begin with, after all. How could the evolutionarily expedient concepts of three-dimensional space, linear time, and solid bits of matter have gradually evolved if those fundamentally fictitious physics concepts were not already factually in effect? Susskind pulls the Newtonian rug of classical physics out from under Darwin's feet, yet assumes that the standard interpretation of the neo-Darwinian theory of the origin and essence of consciousness still stands. So he's saying... The human species and other species were forced to perceive the world through this Newtonian paradigm by Darwinian evolution. But in reality, things are made of these vibrating strings, which are all superimposed at the horizon of the cosmos, where the past, the present, and the future coexist. Well, those two worldviews contradict each other. If the past, the present, and the future coexist out at the horizon of the cosmos, then there cannot be a random... Darwinian evolution along a linear timeline. And if those little bits of matter aren't randomly combining over enormous amounts of time, then where is Darwin's theory? So it seems more likely to say that the past, the present, and the future coexisting at the cosmic horizon, that means that there is no evolution. It's a fixed story. Natural history is complete. I'll read here from Einstein and then from Sir Roger Penrose, who both point out that it's more natural to think of the world as this four-dimensional space-time. And when, when I'm reading this, the point to keep in mind is how they both say that it's not accurate to say that there is an evolution of the universe. So here, is what Einstein says. He says, Since there exists in this four-dimensional structure, space-time, no longer any sections which represent now objectively, the concepts of happening and becoming are indeed not completely suspended, but yet complicated. It appears, therefore, more natural to think of physical reality as a four-dimensional existence instead of, as hitherto, the evolution of a three-dimensional existence. And Sir Roger Penrose says the idea that the history of the universe should be viewed physically as a four-dimensional space-time rather than as a three-dimensional space evolving with time is indeed fundamental to modern physics. And Susskind himself clearly accepts the idea that the past, the present, and the future coexist. 
he says specifically at the horizon of the cosmos. So, um, now that idea of the evolution of the universe being contained in the horizon of the cosmos and then radiating in to create the cinematic hologram of the universe, that is a reenactment of the Vedanta philosophy and Plato's philosophy. So it contradicts his Darwinian idea of what a self is, and it bolsters the idea of the self presented by the Vedanta philosophers and Plato and Carl Jung, this archetype of the self. Each individual self is one with the universal self understood specifically as this infinitely powerful point in the center of the universe which somehow encompasses the entire outermost sphere and that the illusion of three-dimensional forms evolving over time radiates in on these fundamental threads that is found in the Vedanta cosmology and in Plato as we've seen. So the fact that Susskind, in the name of Darwinian philosophy, has forwarded this new cosmology, which reinvents the ancient cosmology of the Vedanta philosophers and Plato, I'm saying that that, I'll read here on page 101, I say, the uncanny compatibility of Susskind's string theory with a pan-psychic cosmology he scorns predictably conforms to two of Jung's theories, his theory of a parallel between psychology and physics, which he developed with Pauli, and his theory about the psychological process that results from being too one-sided in our worldview. And he calls that process enantiodrama. So I'll read from Jung himself. He says, I use the term enantiodrama to describe the emergence of the unconscious opposites with particular relation to its chronological sequence. This characteristic phenomenon occurs almost universally wherever an extreme one-sided tendency dominates the conscious life, for this involves the gradual development of an equally strong unconscious counterposition. So I'm saying that while Susskind was very one-sidedly attacking what he calls the illusion of intelligent design, his unconscious mind, where the collective unconscious archetypes reside, was creating the exact opposite of what he thought consciously that he was doing and that he has given us back this ancient cosmology of the universal mind and the unity of each individual psyche with the psyche of the cosmos as a whole. So now I want to read a little bit from a classic book, The Tao of Physics by the physicist and philosopher Fritjof Chopra. So this he was one of the first people to popularize the idea of seeking parallels between philosophy, especially Eastern philosophy, but he, he mentions Greek philosophy too, and 20th century physics. So here is from the Tao of Physics. It is fascinating to see that 20th century science, which originated in the Cartesian split and in the mechanistic worldview, and which indeed only became possible because of such a view, now overcomes this fragmentation and leads back to the idea of unity expressed in the early Greek and Eastern philosophies. So that's what Fritz Joff Chopra says, and I say in the book, it is also fascinating to see that Susskind, with the explicit intention of furthering the mechanistic worldview, which started with Descartes' definition of the absolute split between mind and matter, should provide instead what appears to be a mathematically precise description of the idea of unity expressed in the ancient Hindu and Platonic cosmologies. And I end that reference to the Cartesian split, as we discussed in the previous video. Rene Descartes defined matter as extended, unthinking substance and mind as unextended, thinking substance. And his definition of God, the ultimate thinking and therefore materially unex unextended substance, is very similar to the idea of the gravitational singularity. So I'll just read that again. Descartes' definition of God, he says, By the name of God, I understand an infinite substance, eternal, immutable, independent, omniscient, omnipotent, and by which I and all the other things which exist have been created and produced. His definition of God is very similar to the idea of the gravitational singularity, which is unextended in space. It has infinite power because it's infinitely dense. It's omniscient in the sense that all the past, the present, and the future of space is contained within it. In the next video, I will 
analyze in, in greater detail Jung's attempt to define the psyche, which led to his equation of the psyche equals highest intensity in the smallest space. And I'll explain how that equation can be translated as the fundamental equation of my book, which is psyche equals singularity. Oh, oh, oh.